Okay. Um, very good afternoon to all of you, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this afternoon's uh, webinar uh, by uh, Professor uh, Ishmael Ruffles. Uh, it's my pleasant duty to present a very uh, short introduction to um, Professor Ruffles' background. Uh, he started his uh, life um, as a scientist. He has bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD degree in various aspects of uh, biophysics, bachelor's in physics, master's in statistical physics, a PhD in biophysics. Uh, and uh, after a brief uh, postdoc at Cornell, uh, his uh, professional life uh, took a turn towards uh, um, uh, science and technology policy. And uh, to initiate that process, he actually did a second master's, and this time uh, it was in uh, policy-related uh, issues at uh, the uh, well-known Science Policy Research Unit of uh, Sussex University. Uh, he continued at uh, Sussex, uh, uh, in fact, the SPRU, as a research fellow and senior lecturer until 2012. And since then, uh, he was uh, uh, back in uh, uh, Spain uh, uh, as, a, as a research fellow at uh, the uh, University, Polytechnic University of uh, Valencia. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he moved to Leiden, where his current affiliation is, uh, at the Center for uh, uh, Science and Technology Studies. And uh, he has been involved in uh, several different activities. The, the most important one for uh, the talk that he is going to be presenting today uh, is this. Uh, according to his website uh, at Leiden, it says, uh, um, uh, Ishmael has been involved in initiatives on responsible metrics, such as the Leiden Manifesto, uh, the easy expert group on open science indicators, um, on our discussions on uh, biases against research in peripheral topics and regions. I think uh, this is uh, going to form a major part of uh, his uh, presentation today. And uh, also it, uh, the uh, uh, bio says uh, previously, he has uh, developed indicators and mapping methods for the evaluation of interdisciplinary research. Uh, for example, the emergent fields uh, such as uh, bio and uh, uh, nanotechnology. So uh, with that uh, very brief introduction, I'm going to uh, yield the screen to uh, Ishmael, so over to you, Ishmael. Okay, well, thanks uh, for the presentation and thanks uh, for uh, uh, hosting me uh, for these weeks. It's really a pleasure uh, being here at the STCPR in, in Bangalore and uh, meeting so many people. Um, so um, my center, uh, as you may know, is one of the historical centers for the development of bibliometrics and particularly the use of uh, bibliometrics for the purposes of research evaluation. But then it was also one of the first places where um, critical, I'm not sure whether it was one of the first places in the world, but in Europe, uh, at least uh, it was one of the centers that started a reflection on the potential misuses, abuses, or put problems uh, derived from the use of Santa metrics. And uh, one thing that we try to do is uh, to take um, the possibilities that Santa metrics offers for studying uh, science, but try to think it how it can be used in policy in sensible ways. And um, whereas, uh, let's say, uh, many of uh, the uses of bibliometrics have been problematic in terms of um, supporting research assessments that reduced the amount of diversity in science, I'm going to present an attempt of using scientometrics tools to thinking how um, science is the science and research assessment priorities are biased and how they um, might be um, improved. Uh, so let me see, I'll try to share the screen now. 
Um, can you please confirm that I'm sharing the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Let me see the slides. Okay, good. So, um, I'll, I don't have any um, block with me. So please, uh, if, okay, we have here Praia who will help me. Um, so the talk is going to be about finding alignment and misalignment between research agendas and societal needs. And I will end um, by thinking more in policy terms of how um, these misalignments suggest that diversity and inclusion matter in science. The argument is not a new argument. We think that our contribution is in providing more empirical evidence to an argument that's been made uh, for quite a long time by a variety of researchers um, in different ways. We claim that there is a serious misalignment between research efforts and health needs in many countries. And uh, the evidence we have suggests, although it doesn't prove categorically, but suggests that this misalignment between research efforts and global health needs is due to the concentration of research in the global north, which means that health needs in the global north receive more attention. Also to the fact that health demand is driven by the markets of the rich countries. And also this is further supported by notions of excellence, of academic excellence, which are framed in terms of visibility and which are related to these, uh, you know, to, to, to what's happening in the most prestigious centers. Um, and uh, there is this feedback between funding, which is for research, which is more prominent in the rich countries, which moreover have the market demands, and excellence, which means that there are a number of issues that get unattended. And uh, the idea is that open science policies and practice, the open science agenda, particularly as proposed by UNESCO in terms of participation, dialogue with other types of knowledges and having a clear goal of science as being a global public good. So science that benefits for everybody should be a way of trying to get out of uh, these uh, locking into certain uh, disease topics. Um, so let's begin with uh, the argument that um, research priorities don't align with needs. This is something that we can discuss in a variety of areas, in energy, climate change, in health. There is a lock in of institutional dynamics in public, in higher education organizations and interest that shape research priorities towards those issues which are more relevant in the North or for the, even for the rich populations of the North. And more often, even in democracies, the populations that are not attended don't have the agency, the capacity of influence the government in order to shape research choices. Um, and what we propose is that in science policy, um, we are in a position in which by combining scientometric methods and qualitative methods of participation, there is the possibility of enriching the priority setting processes so as to rebalance the research portfolios. 
And for this, uh, there is this effort in opening science and technology towards making visible research trajectories visible and fostering the participation of relevant stakeholders so as to provide the opinion about which priorities might be desirable to pursue. Um, and at, this, at the highest level, the misalignment between um, research priorities and needs can be seen at the level of sustainable development goals. Um, mapping um, sustainable development goals in terms of publications is highly problematic. But if we take that you can do a very um, rough estimate um, in a recent project um, called the Strings, um, we came up with an estimate that what is in less developed countries, uh, there is a relatively high investment in research that is related to SDGs. And this is because um, countries <clears throat> which have very little resources for research tend to put these resources in agriculture and health in middle income countries and in high income countries, the percentage of research which is clearly related to SDGs is relatively low. We estimate it around 30% uh, for our income countries and around 20, 30% for middle income countries. So research is not clearly linked to the most pressing societal goals. And how can we think if there is uh, this alignment? For this, I, I'm going to talk a bit of the notion of directionality. Uh, this is something, it's a notion that has been increasingly talked about, uh, at least in, in Europe, in terms of mission-oriented research. So in mission-oriented research, you have an issue, let's say climate change, and then the question is whether research is following trajectories that are aligned with the needs of climate change. Now, um, in traditional science and technology indicators, what we have been measuring is whether you have more or less research in a given field, in a given institution, but there was no the notion of direction. Um, so the idea here is that we can develop heuristics. They don't need to be sort of very uh, mathematically rigorous in the way that we are in the natural sciences, thinking of directions. And we can do this in two ways, in terms of thinking whether the direction of research in types of problems is following the needs or whether the direction of research and types of solutions is following the type of solutions which are most uh, desirable or desired. And uh, you can think of this as having um, one vector. In this case, you could see be a, a vector. Here we have a vector of disease types. And in this vector, we can look at how much research um, data is on so each of the dimensions of the vector would be a different type of disease uh, family, like cancer, cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases, mental health, uh, neurological conditions. And then we can compare. So this vector is going to tell us in which direction research in diseases is going. And we can compare these with estimates of needs. For example, in this case, we estimate the needs in terms of disease burden. And this allows us to see that, um, whereas there's a lot of publications in cancer that it, in relation to its disease burden for cardiovascular diseases and infectious diseases, we have the opposite. And this is not an, a new approach. Uh, Professor Aron Ashalam had done similar types of the studies um, with people Also uh, in the US, the National Institute of Health, we're doing this type of estimates in terms of uh, 
fund, uh, expenditure in funding uh, projects uh, for the National Institute of Health, uh, for example, in Gross, and Rottingen did this in terms of um, global health. So this is about directions in what type of problems are being addressed. Another type of direction is thinking what type of solutions for a given uh, issue. In this case, we have a, a map of rice research. Each of the nodes in this map is a descriptor of publications in rice research. And by putting them according to their similarity in a map, we can get six zones, six areas of rice research, research related to transgenics, research related to classical genetics, research related to pests uh, and wheat, and to plant nutrition. This is uh, about crop yield, to socioeconomic issues or to consumption. And then we can see which in which areas different countries are more focused. So by doing a projection of the number of publications of a given country, in this case, the US, we see that the US had a direction towards the transgenic uh, research and rice research, whereas India was relatively more focused um, in increasing crop yield, whereas Thailand was relatively more focused in issues about food science and technology. Um, and Thailand being the biggest exporter of rice in the world. So we have this notion of direction, which is about either what type of problems or what type of solutions is a research system focused in. And now we are going to see some of these examples um, in the issue that is our concern, which is in terms of um, global inequalities. And I'll go into some detail in this case of uh, disease burden uh, in the global north versus the global south. What we did in this study with Alfredo Yegros is we took the public, we took the diseases classified by the World Health Organization, uh, which had disease burden, and we classified the 100 diseases available into five categories, those which were more prevalent in high-income countries, 1A, those which were equally prevalent in high-income countries and low and middle-income countries, and these is uh, issues such as heart uh, problems, depression, schizophrenia, and then those diseases which were more prevalent in low income countries such as malaria, the real diseases. And then um, we could look at percentage of publications divided by unit of disease burden as calculated by World Health, World Health Organization, which is Dallas, Disability Adjusted Life Years. And what we see is that there are 10 times more publications per unit of burden for the diseases that are most prevalent in high-income countries in comparison to those which are, are most prevalent in low-income countries. Now, this was well known. I think the contribution of, of the, our study was to show that even those diseases that are equally prevalent in high and low-income countries, which is the ones type B, there is a twofold uh, difference. And if you remember, it was mentioning issues such as schizophrenia, um, depression, which are still present in high-income countries, but they are present in particularly in the poor populations. Now, um, why is there this imbalance? Well, the first um, reason is that research is heavily focused is uh, happening mainly in high-income countries. Um, so about 80% of the publications mentioning diseases are 
uh, in high income countries. Some research happens that in uh, middle income countries and very little in uh, low income countries. Therefore, it is not a surprise that um, the research is more focused on the diseases of the North. Now, it is not only the, uh, um, the issue of being in the North, it is also the fact that we know that the pharmaceutical, it is known that pharmaceutical uh, public uh, companies have an influence in the agenda of health. And what we see, what we did is to compare the number of publications um, that are for the whole world, which are mainly academic publications in blue, with those publications authored by pharma, which are maybe uh, like 5% or 3% of the total, and those publications funded by Big Pharma. And what we see is that the patterns are very similar, uh, suggesting, so pharma does much more research on the diseases of the high-income countries and much less of the diseases of the low-income countries. And the proportions in which uh, there is this increase are surprisingly similar to what public research does. So this suggests that um, it is that pharmaceutical industries are heavily influencing public. And finally, um, we we're talking about prestige being an, another of the big drivers of researchers choosing topics. So the the first one might be the, 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 the needs in the country where you're doing the research. The second, the funding by pharma. The third, perceptions of prestige. In terms of perceptions of prestige, we see that in high income countries, doing research in any disease type provides more or less the same type amount of recognition in terms of citations, but in upper middle income countries and in lower middle income countries, doing research in the diseases of the rich, it's cancers uh, and uh, neurodegenerative diseases, um, yields 50% more citations than if you do the diseases of which are more prevalent in low-income countries. This is not the case in low-income countries, but if you remember, the publications of low-income countries represent a tiny percentage, 0.6% of the total publications in uh, diseases. So this, is, um, this suggests that research assessment, either formally or informally, or notions of prestige, are shaping um, agendas towards the diseases that are more, more, more prevalent in the North. So this was the first block um, in terms of what we call type one misalignment in terms of which problems are pursued. And Pragya, how, how are we doing time-wise, uh, 15 minutes? Yes, yes. Excellent. Um, the second type of misalignment is about the misalignment in what type of research is carried out in terms of the topics. Let me begin with an example. This is again from the project Strings, which was led uh, by Spru. Um, we, there were three case studies in that project, which were trying to think what type of research in a given problem, the three problems were Chagas disease, overfishing in Lake Victoria, and rise in Orissa, would be more helpful for people, in, for the people in the region to improve their SDGs. 
So in Lake Victoria, we have overfishing. This leads to a conflict between the small fishes in the Lake Victoria and the industrial fisheries. Now, when you look at what type of research is funded, it is a research, it is a type of research that it's about genetics, genomics, focus on improving the genetic stock of the fish. And therefore, it is related to exports of the fish to global markets. And this is done by the industrial fisheries rather than the small fisheries. And whereas for improving the health, the living conditions, the SDGs uh, related conditions of uh, the small fishes, there are issues such as clean water that do not get addressed by public research. Another example is uh, the focus of artificial intelligence. Uh, um, artificial intelligence research has been carried out by a variety of actors. In the last 10 years, it's picked up uh, a lot in corporations. Now, a recent study uh, by Nesta, the think tank in London, found that the AI research in involving private sector tends to be less diverse. It is more focused on this data hungering computational intensive data deep learning methods, whereas other types of um, AI research, like symbolic and statistical methods that allow better or more discussions on the societal and ethical implications of AI are much less studied. So again, the, the direction of research is focused towards um, the interest of corporations. Um, I'm muted. Can you? I muted myself, I hope you can still hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So it's about misalignment in, in mental health. This was a project in which um, Vinova, the Swedish innovation agency, was asked to contribute to the Swedish uh, new plan for mental health, the national strategy for mental health of the Swedish government <laughs> with a questioning of the type of health research uh, that was being um, carried out. So they asked us to see if we could look at whether there was more or less research in issues such as prevention, social determinants uh, of health and uh, health system research, which are perceived by experts as issues to be improved. And uh, what we found out is uh, that at the global level, um, there has been an increase, substantive increase, more than 50% increase in the last 10 years in the disciplines that are related to uh, public health, to healthcare systems, to social determinants. However, they still remain on less than one fifth of the total amount of research which is carried out, which is still heavily focused on the disciplines such as psychiatry and related medical specialties that are the dominant uh, disciplines in health, as well as issues more related to prestige uh, science, which are related to uh, like brain research, neurosciences. So a core, well, given this distribution, and given the perception by experts that more research should be 
carried out in addressing this determinants of mental health, here we see a misalignment. So this type of discussion on well, this type of analysis on what are the de facto priorities, the directions of research, allows us to have questions about what type of research should be conducted in mission-oriented research um, issues such as if we uh, need to move to a zero carbon economy, what type of technological insights would or technologies should um, public sector be developing? Um, and then there, the variety, the, the, this allows you to put questions as well, should we have more research on wind turbines, more research on biofuels and nuclear plants, but also on issues that are not necessarily the silver solution te technology, but related to management. So these centralized network uh, systems might be a better way or discussed as a better way to um, deal with energy in the case of um, renewable energies or improving the thermic isolation of housing or reduction of transportation. And the question is whether a research system um, is balancing the focus on these different areas, given the high uncertainties about which research avenue is likely to lead to solutions. So this leads us, so we have seen that there are problems in terms of lack of alignment of research with the problems that are important. We have seen that the type of solutions are also heavily influenced by interest and mean that science is not necessarily making the best contribution that it could be doing. And the claim that I'm going to make now is that these um, can be improved by diversifying topics and including the stakeholders in thinking about what type of research is relevant. In general, this shift towards participation is part of a shift of how we think innovation policies, policy. In the 60s and 90s, the dominant model, the dominant framing of innovation policy was in terms of what was known as the linear model. It was assumed that the more research, the more innovation, more economic growth, and more economic growth would lead to more well-being. In the 90s and 2000s, uh, the dominant model became innovation systems with the arrival of Japan as an innovation leader in the 80s. An innovation leader that did not have a strong research system behind, there would be, was awareness that it was not just a question of having more research, but in linking the different bits of the innovation system. And that for research to contribute to innovation, it was extremely important that there were uh, linkages between small firms and academia, between the small firms and big uh, companies developing, of sell, uh, selling the technologies. Now, this model uh, is uh, still the dominant model in the OECD, um, but in recent years, even in the OECD, and um, there's been, or the European Commission, there's been a change of flavor with the awareness that although there has, you know, that the innovation systems was a good system in order to think how to support innovation, it was not a good system in terms of what I, call, what I was calling the directionality. 
it was not a good system to prevent what the economists call negative externalities of the, the environmental harm or the increasing inequalities. And that it was necessary to think innovation with, in terms of missions that address needs or missions that address SDGs such as climate change, thinking about directionality. Now, um, we should not be thinking this uh, with uh, the idea that research will yield solutions. The relationship between research and uh, innovation is complicated. Um, but definitely research can contribute towards solutions by providing capabilities. So there's training people, setting up infrastructure, setting up technologies that might be used further downstream to come up with solutions. It should also be recognized that there is a high uncertainty in terms of, you know, when I was talking before about what type of energy solutions are best. And um, there is really huge of uncertainty when, about which solutions may work and which solutions may not work. Uh, we have the, the case of malaria, for example, in which in spite of the huge amount of investment in trying to come up with vaccines or drugs so far, improvement in health um, has come from low-tech insecticides nets, which is uh, something that 30 years ago, um, I suppose very few experts would have uh, guessed. So there is a huge uncertainty, and in the face of uncertainty, it is better to have diverse portfolios. And finally, there is the issue about social context and differences in values. Um, in some contexts, in some regions, countries, um, some types of interventions will be preferred over others. Let's take obesity. For some people, um, the solution they'll be happy with a pharmacological solution to obesity. Many more people would prefer diet solutions, taking exercise. But now one of the solutions is bariatric surgery. There are a variety of options in different sections of our plural societies would prefer different solutions. And um, so these three characteristics, the, the fact that research is not contributing directly to solutions, the fact that there is a high uncertainty about which research will contribute to actual solutions, and the fact that different people will value different um, the type of solutions that can provide it, means that keeping diversity of topics is extremely important. And here is where I think open science comes in. And um, in the sense, not only of providing transparency and accessibility of the variety of knowledges which are produced, but within this UNESCO framing uh, in providing, um, in making the emphasis that the participation of stakeholders and societal actors is extremely important for research to address the topics in terms of which problems and to address the approaches in terms of which types of solutions are preferred um, by the communities. Um, and uh, this is, uh, as is mentioned in uh, some studies, uh, thinking about how science can contribute to uh, societal challenges, there is this emphasis that the solutions to societal challenges, which are wicked problems, are very unlikely to come from silver bullet 
solutions, but rather they will come from a combination of responses with different actors and referring more emphasis on one or the other response, which is why um, participatory approaches and deliberative approaches um, can help in informing governments about what type of uh, priorities could be used to diversify currently rather narrow research portfolios. Um, one example of how participation in, um, improves in addressing the issues of concern is the fact that there is evidence that there is a link between addressing gender and sex related issues in health when groups have a higher percentage of, when research groups have a higher percentage of research women. So here you have the, the, the proportion of women and you see that with more women in a research group, there is more attention to gender and sex analysis research. Now, in terms of portfolios, what we are trying to do is, is the following. And I'll just make a, a sketch. We're trying to develop maps of science. In this case, this is mental health, in which we look at what is the research landscape. And we, by the size of the bubbles, you see in which areas there is more or less research. And then we can position a given funder in this landscape. So we, and I'm going to show two examples. Um, one example is the comparison between two health research councils. At the bottom, there is Sweden, Swedish Research Council uh, for Health, Forte. And at the top, there's the Spanish Health Research Council. And as you see, the profiles are very different. Um, if we go back, oops, sorry, I went the wrong direction. Now, if we go back, this is the same map. Um, the biomedical and psychiatric solutions are at the right hand side. The healthcare, public health solutions are at the left hand side. And you see that what is the Spanish approach is focusing on the biomedical and psychiatric solutions, the more traditional biomedical approaches. For this, the Swedish approach is much more balanced. It's actually um, much more focused in uh, addressing the uh, social determinants, public health uh, issues. Um, another comparison is that was for health research councils. Now we look at councils that uh, have all type of research. And here you can compare the European research councils, which you know it's, it's um, c'est la crème de la crème, as they say in French, of uh, the European funding. And interestingly, it focuses on uh, brain research, so imaging, whereas the research council of Norway is much more diverse and much more focused also on public health uh, issues. So in, in summary, in the face of this concentration of research in certain topics that tend to favor the rich population of rich countries, we propose the following approach. Um, one, to map the research priorities with publications, with projects. Second, to do exercises mapping the needs, which can be uh, done with uh, estimates of health needs, but very often you will need uh, the participation of expertise, experts, and finally have deliberative processes that enrich the discussions and that are critical about uh, current uh, focuses. Um, so in summary, the agenda is about fostering diversity in research as a means to align research with societal needs. 
broadening participation, both of the citizens and in terms of the workforce, as with the hope that these will um, pluralize research topics and the pluralization of research topics will improve the distribution of the benefits of science. And I will leave it here. Well, thanks so much for the attention. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ishmael. Um, I guess uh, you're open to some answering some questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, now the floor is open. Uh, uh, please raise your hand uh, using the appropriate button here. I don't even know where it is, but I guess you would know. So, um, Okay, we have the first one, Radhika. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, so much, Smile. I mean, it was wonderful uh, presentation and it gives us insights through how the basic approach we have to use while defining the policy priorities. Uh, so my question is regarding the three models that you showed for the innovation policies, starting with the linear model. Uh, so in these three models, how you see that how linkages between various STI actors play an important role and how we have to bring that in the innovation policy formulation itself. So how like we studied in the innovation system, linkages is very important role. And we study seven different functions, how these linkages will impact on uh, how STI ecosystem work. So how you think the linkages between STI actors will play an important role in innovation policy formulation process itself. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Um, the, so for people coming from, from, from the innovation uh, systems tradition, they sometimes, so the, the, the model that I presented, may, maybe I, I can go back to, to the slide. Let me see. Is a model. Whoop. Let me see if I managed to put it back. Uh, no, we are not seeing the slides yet. Okay. Uh, the slides and then, then go back. Uh, now, yes. Okay, good. Uh, this. Right. Um, I have to say that th this um, framework, the, 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 these uh, is, I should have put the reference. Well, there's a, this, is, this separation of three frameworks of innovation policy was proposed by Johann Schott and Ed Steinmuller. Um, they were in a, a sprue. Um, and uh, it is a very, it, it's, it's a broad simplification, yeah? The, so people like uh, Judith Suits uh, that you might be acquainted with, she act, and people who talked about inclusive uh, innovation uh, have also view they say that actually in innovation systems, if you consider the linkages with the users or the beneficiaries of the research as something important, you might already be in the third framing. So, well, just what I want to say is, is that this, is, this model is, is a very uh, rough model and uh, the, um, it, Shouldn't taking as as uh, you know as something that happened really this way. Now, regard your question is, I don't remember the seven functions. These the seven functions I have. This comes from the functional view of innovation systems um, by people in Utrecht and uh, Sweden, if I'm not wrong. But now I wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to relate it, honestly. I, it's, been a, it's been quite some time that I, I please, uh, if you can 
okay yeah uh, so i just wanted to understand that is how we see linkages and the actors playing an important role in formulation of an sti uh, ecosystem in the country but when we are talking about right at the policy stage how you see through these models we can bring actors together to decide the policy priorities what are the policy objectives for the country and then how the policy to be formulated keeping in mind the role of actors so we know uh, we have models that study how these actors play an important role in actual implementation of a science technology and innovation so yes. if we go little backwards right at setting the policy priorities in the country or to an organization or to a specific domain so how you see this engagement between various actors will play an important role i think they could play a role so the, the, when we think this we are thinking uh, in providing these type of tools to funding agencies and the idea would be um, that we, so we, to be honest, I, I don't have a model of how the actors would be brought in. There could be um, deliberative processes and related to high level priority setting. But um, I think you can also do more down to earth discussions at the level of actual project distribution. So when you have project distribution, so you, you, have, you can have discussions of, okay, within the Medical Research Council of how much funding you're going to give to cardiovascular versus infectious diseases or versus cancer. Um, but you're going to have a big part of your portfolio, which is response mode, for example, for uh, postdocs. And it turns out that many of the postdocs which will get the funding will be so doing the funding in cancer, will, will be getting, they'll be excellent, but excellent in cancer. So notions about excellence are biased by the political economy. And my proposal would be that funding agencies take these inequalities into account when doing the distribution. So if you want to do, uh, so when doing the distribution of postdocs, you might also think what are the topics that are relevant so that not that less than half of it at least goes to issues other than cancer. This is the type of engagement I'm I am thinking it within funding agencies at the high level, of course, deliberate, um, but also at more uh, managerial level. So, so but not imposing views, but at least getting the committees to realize how unbalanced are the current portfolios. Right, thank you, thank you so much. But I'm, I, I, have, I think you have a better idea, so please, uh, if you want to comment on, on, you, on your ideas, I'd be really interested in hearing. Right, definitely. Uh, we will have your presentation if that would be allowed from your slide, uh, like site, and uh, we'll circle back to you through email to continue this conversation. Also, it would be great to have discussion further on that. Uh, like I, I personally am interested in work how system interconnectedness work. And this is more on how STI works in the country, but going back to right at the first phase when the priorities are set for the specific project or a program or as a nation, how uh, these actors will uh, play an important role. Of course, like you man mentioned, that one is the political system, the government has to play a role. Then from the managerial side who are actually going to manage that thing, we need to get inputs from them also. So how these consultations and what is the mechanism so that we get an inclusive participation of all these actors should play a role. So definitely I'll circle back to you on that. Thank you, thank you so much. So just a brief comment on this, what we've, what my colleagues tell me uh, from the European Commission, for example, is that lobbies play a major role 
for the case of AI seems to have been quite a scandal and how big companies have managed to uh, shape the code of conduct for AI research. So that it's really problematic. So how, how participation sort of is shaped by those who have different types of power. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just to follow up before we move to my colleague, uh, in your uh, view, do you see lobby as a positive effect or a negative effect? Like in US, we have a, a legalized lobby system. Like in India, we do not have a legal system. But still, we understand like there are like lobbying carried out for specific projects or specific domains. I mean, I'm not uh, not willing to comment on that. Is it uh, how it like in my viewpoint, it happens, uh, but it's not legal. But in countries and in some of European countries, the lobbying is legal. And uh, what is your perception on that? How well it impacts the future of our STI? Uh I do not know about the legal status of lobby. What I hear from experts in the European Commission is that um, in order to make political decisions on environmental issues, you need data. And the lobbies have the deep pockets to provide the data, whereas NGOs don't, don't have the, the capacity to come up with the data that it's needed, that it is allegedly needed to make the decisions, right? So, so it's not even being, you know, it's not even being evil, but I think with public universities not doing their work, like universities or public research organizations not being active in defending the public good, in the fact, you know, given that we, that universities have the resources to do sort of impartial, you know, uh, information. They maybe they, they are not doing enough to compensate for the information that lobbies manage to provide. That's that's what what I've heard from very informed people. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um... Any other questions? Yeah, um, uh, Ishmael, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, this interesting difference uh, in the realm of uh, mental health uh, oriented research. The differences that you showed in the priorities are set by Sweden as opposed to Spain, right? And yep. it was a pretty uh, stark, uh, pretty uh, clear uh, differences. Then uh, my question is, what is the difference in the way the research funding uh, ecosystem is organized in these two countries, which leads to this kind of uh, differences? Um, first, I, sh I should say that the outlier is Sweden, not Spain. Okay, all right. So, so then what, is, what is special about Sweden then? I think what is special about Sweden is that in Sweden, they take public health very seriously. Right. So the research council for health is called research council for health and welfare affairs and labor. Okay. So very clearly the mission is health and well-being and labor conditions. In Spain, um, the Spain ha has has a good, it's in relation to its income level, has a good healthcare system. In terms of hospitals, and the hospitals being good, they also have a lot of research and they capture then all money that's coming from the government, okay. and and they capture it in in and and use it in, in those areas which are seen as uh, fashionable, high prestige and so on. Is that okay? So the since the Medical Research Council does not have a strategy of diversifying, then the money goes to what is excellent. Okay. And I'm not saying that they do not deserve the money. What I'm sure. saying is that this creates a system with serious gaps. Right. 
Um, and and I think and actually uh, you see it's interesting if you look at Oxford Cambridge research is not going to public health is not going it's it's the same right so the great places of science in science comes from a biomedical tradition where you have great science it gets into the traditional topics rather than those topics which are most needed okay i very very interesting so uh, uh, if there are yeah there is one more question from nidhi nidhi go ahead yeah thank you professor abhi and i would like to thank professor smile for such a wonderful and insightful presentation so i have a uh, this question because i am studying the emerging biomedical innovation system and where i am studying the dynamics of emerging technology technologies uh, biomedical technologies in india specific to indian context so what i have found apart from political dynamics which are influencing the the development and diffusion of the technology there are certain factors which are responsible for technological failures so uh, what i have studied like uh, by seven innovation system framework i have studied the development and diffusion of particular technology and then i have found that there are various factors like directionality of research reflexivity amongst the uh, the uh, the actors those who are performing and the absence of policy coordination between the actors and there are uncertainties of the emerging technological systems and the lack of inter and inter intra institutional collaborations so i would like to reflect i would like to know your opinion and uh, like to the like that you, like you to reflect on it on these factors what you think about this okay um these uh, can, can you tell me what type of emerging technologies um so i have studied the molecular diagnostic innovation system in india and uh, specific to the, uh, the the development of technologies in resource poor constrained settings in india and now i am studying the synthetic biology development in india so in these two technology both have the same dynamics if we uh, if we see about the development and diffusion so there are yes i agree there are the political dynamics which are involved and which are also responsible for the the failure of the sustainable technological development in india but there are various factors also like lack of the flexibility among the, uh, the the different actors lack of policy coordination between the actors and there is a lack of directionality of research from the funding agencies so uh, i just wanted your opinion what have what you have found in your studies whether these factors are equally important the in the countries in which you have studied or it is just specific to indian context so i just wanted to know that right so let, let me um, um explain uh, how i uh, arrived to this type of studies i i i used to do studies on nanotechnology right and uh, there was this question of how nanotechnology can better contribute to society and uh, in the end so you what you were doing is, is trying to so from nanotechnology thinking you know, we are looking into which groups were reflexing risks and were thinking in terms of directionality um and in the end, and so, so is this, from nanotechnology, you have many potential applications, right? And then it would be a question of pick up the applications that were relevant for society. Now, in the end, I came to the conclusion, actually, isn't it better to start with the problem if the goal is not to develop the technology, but the goal is to improve um, people's life. So if we have a problem like tuberculosis, isn't it better to start, okay, we have a problem tuberculosis, let's look at the research that we're carrying out and diagnostics is useful. And, you know, having social workers that go house by house, and um, there was Professor Arunachalan was explaining to me, like uh, people who are going 
house by house, seeing if there was compliance with taking the drugs. So what type of um, interventions are possible? How, how can research contribute to these interventions? I, I, so I see that uh, emerging technologies are important, but in a way, um, focus, the, 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 the current focus on, on technology push might be excessive. You know, I think, that I think that in innovation and science policy, there is room for putting more thinking into uh, the demand side, which is what is going to help you in these issues of directionality, reflexivity, and then what type of coordination is necessary. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that problem, uh, problem solving goal oriented approach that you are stressing out, it's very important. And especially, uh, like if what I have found in molecular diagnostic, if we talk about the resource poor constraint settings in India, so we we wanted to have more point of care diagnostics. So if we start doing research to have. Uh, to uh, to to focus on the more uh, like as you are mentioning that to focus focus should be on the more highly burdened disease of India. So it should be a context specific problem solving goal oriented approach. And I I really I am I'm agreeing with you. And thank you so much for your insight. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And I see one more hand raised from the host. So who would this be? I'm not sure. I can't see the that, name. That is me. OK. Do I need to move to a separate room? Okay. OK. So this is basically about the work that you have done where you were talking about uh, the biomedical research and the prestige and uh, like how it is focused in high-income countries versus low-income countries. So there is a this huge thing, huge uh, discussion right now about helicopter research like people from high income countries are coming and taking a patient which are relevant to so what have you found about that in your study and if you have actually made this kind of distinction like uh, in the data that you showed us that okay this uh, this work has been done by researchers within LMICs or they are done by H, uh, researchers from HIT and what do you have to say about it like how the funding about it moves and like what what's your perception on it right so the let me see what I'll do is I'll, I'll go back to these maps um, and I if you can switch off the micro the um, go back to the maps um be, um because so we we have not done studies of, of helicopter research but what i'll suggest is is that uh can you see the right you see now uh yeah so the idea is uh so the, the, the problem with helicopter research um, is that it might be doing, um, it might, might be focused in issues that people from the helicopter think that they are relevant, but that they're not relevant in the ground, right? Uh, and, and, and so um, the only thing that I can contribute here is, is to say that would it would be possible in the so we have these maps or it can be you know you you can actually look at what type of topics and see that we see that uh, in the us there is a focus on genomics and trans and uh, transgenic price research so the question is whether empirically we can show that helicopter research deals with topics that are different like India's research was focused on crop yield and um, helicopter research, let's say, by the uh, Gates Foundation, is it on topics different that the stakeholders do not find appropriate? I think the, this type of discussions might be held and what we might contribute is actually is in 
like the, the types of tools we develop, is a, we are not, uh, the, the idea is that we should not be saying what type of research is good or bad, as in science policy, one of our tasks is to provide tools that facilitate the analysis by the relevant stakeholders of which research might be appropriate or not. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I don't see any other, I don't see any other hand up. So um, with that, I mean, we'll um, close this session. Thank you so much, uh, Ishmael, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And My pleasure. Uh, patient answering of uh, uh, the questions from the audience. So uh, we look forward to further interactions with you. So thank you so much. Thanks to you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.